There are a lot of really cool looking electric vertical takeoff and landing designs out there at the moment. And they're all promising to transform how we will move around in our cities in the future. We'll have to wait and see how realistic that actually is. But in this video, we will be looking at something else. We will look at the principle of safety culture that lies at the very foundation of why aviation is so safe. A culture that might not be so easy for these new upstarts to swallow. Stay tuned. Before we get into this video, we will need to make something very clear here. This video is not about questioning the safety of EV tool aircraft. Before you will ever get a chance to take a ride in one of these contraptions, before you even see one flying over you or over a densely populated city, the aviation authorities will take their sweet time to make sure that they are as safe as they can possibly be. Since this is new technology, aviation agencies like the FAA in the US and EASA in Europe are working hard on ironing out the details of the requirements for these weird and wonderful designs. And you can be absolutely sure that everyone who are working on these regulations will be playing it extra safe. That's what they always do when they deal with new technology in the aviation field. And that's actually partly the reason why innovation moves so relatively slowly in aviation. If you need proof of this, you can just look at what's happening with the development of conventional fixed wing electric aircraft. A lot of those designs are already flying either in testing or as experimental aircraft, but only one of them, the Pipistrel Velis Electro, is actually type certified under EASA. And even that one is not certified in the US yet. So in this video, I will not talk about the safety of individual aircraft, but instead about how the safety culture in the industry works and how aviation companies discuss safety matters if things start to go wrong during development, for example. It is a delicate subject and it becomes even more delicate and complicated when completely new technologies come into play. And this is one of the reasons why EV tool companies are getting so much attention right now. Because their designs combine a huge amount of cutting edge technology and that can come with some real complications. For example, the EV tool craft combine vertical and horizontal flight capability with electronic flight control systems that can handle the transition between these two flight modes. They will have to prove that they have the necessary redundancy to deal with one or several inoperative motors. And on top of this, they also have to use some exotic super lightweight materials that hasn't previously been used in the industry or it is being used in a completely new way. And on top of getting all of this working, the designers also have to deal with all of the necessary certification hurdles that all airplanes and helicopters face, like I mentioned before. But maybe the most critical innovation these designs really depend on are their cutting edge lithium batteries. And this is quite a big deal because the way that these vehicles use their batteries is a massive challenge, much bigger than most people realize. Because most people assume that electric aircraft, including EV tools, can simply use the same kind of batteries that you'll find in a Tesla or some other electric car, for example. But it turns out that that's not really the case. The reality is that these aircraft need to be able to discharge, that means to draw power from the batteries at much faster rates than any electric car on the road would ever have to do. Plus, since they have to be able to both take off and land vertically, they need to be able to run their motors at high power levels on both takeoff and landing. This means that EV tools need their batteries to have enough performance and distribution capability to be able to deliver similar amount of discharge even when they're running at a relatively low state of charge. These performance requirements means that EV tool batteries have to be designed, constructed and managed differently from those that electrical car manufacturers have been developing. And of course, EV tool batteries and the flying profile that these aircraft will have will need to satisfy the regulators that they are completely safe to use and have the required amount of redundancy that we always require for any aircraft. This is a very complicated matter to cover in detail, but if you want to learn more, I highly recommend that you check out Bjorn Ferm's multi-part deep dive article series on sustainable air transport over at Liam News. Liam News is one of my personal favorite sources and you'll find a link to that series here in the description below. Because of these very challenging requirements, EV tool companies are working closely with their battery suppliers to develop their own specialized battery designs. 
And like everything else, which is new and cutting edge, there's always going to be a lot of trial and error during that type of development. But what does this have to do with aviation safety culture that I was talking about before? And how is this different from the rest of the aviation industry? I will give you all the detail around that after this short message from my sponsor. Are you tired of watching meaningless reality TV? Well then start watching premium factual shows and super high quality documentaries on Curiosity Stream instead. They are a subscription streaming service that provides you with new content every week and you pay less than $20 per year for it, making Curiosity Stream definitely one of the most affordable high quality streaming services out there. Curiosity offers documentaries on varied topics from space exploration to nature, history, music and much much more. The viewing experience is stellar with titles available worldwide on almost all existing platforms. I recently discovered their collection of titles about aviation, which includes some really cool content, I have to say. One episode that stuck out explained the story of the rivalry between Boeing and Airbus. Spicy! So, what are you waiting for? Go to curiositystream.com slash mentor now or click on the link below and use the promo code mentor now to get a whopping 25% off the normal price. That's only $14.99 per year or $1.25 per month, which is really wild. So again, that is curiositystream.com slash mentor now using the promo code mentor now. Thank you CuriosityStream for sponsoring us. Now back to the video. Several companies working on EV tool designs have already had to deal with battery fires during their development. The circumstances leading up to these fires differ, but in the cases that we know about, these fires typically happen during testing on the ground. And some of these incidents have been quite destructive for the involved aircraft. For example, Aviation's first Alice prototype was seriously damaged in a battery fire during ground testing in Arizona in the United States, and a similar event destroyed the first Lilium Phoenix eVTOL in Germany. Both of these events happened in early 2020. But there's also been less dramatic cases of battery fires, and in a recent case involving a company called Beta Technologies, a battery pack was actually in storage, not even in testing when it caught fire. This happened on the 26th of August this year, 2022. Beta later explained that the fire happened to a battery pack which had been reassembled but still required end-of-line testing before getting final approval to be used in flight testing. It is worth noting here that this testing that they mentioned formed part of precautions and procedures that Beta itself had created in order to improve safety, which I think is really commendable. Now, unlike a battery pack for a small drone that might have three or four cells in it, these eVTOL battery packs can have over 10,000 cells, so assembling and testing them is a really big job. Beta stated that the fire was put out quickly, and since the battery wasn't even in their lab at the time, it didn't affect any of the test equipment or their aircraft. Now, the fact that these type of incidents happen isn't a problem in itself. Again, none of these battery pack designs have been submitted for certification yet, at least as far as we know, and most of these fires tend to happen early in the testing phase. Now, the area of safety culture where we might need to pay closer attention here is in how these companies communicate results of their testing and failures with each other. Specifically, how they publicize causes of these fires so that other manufacturers can avoid making the same mistakes. Beta set a really good example here by going public with the fact that this event had even happened in the first place, even though it wasn't on an aircraft or even in its lab. It is going to be super important that all eVTOL and electric aircraft companies out there are as open with their incidents and failures as Beta was in this example. Now, you might ask, well, why wouldn't they be? Well, this sharing of information can be quite tricky because much of the technology around these cutting-edge batteries is proprietary. EV2 developers generally rely on battery suppliers to get their batteries and the battery technology itself tends to be very similar in between them. But the challenges around the operation of the battery packs also involve something called battery management systems or BMS. And developing the procedures and discovering the safe operating limits in these systems can be as proprietary as the batteries themselves. That is also the case for the assembly techniques of the battery packs, cooling setups and other even more complicated factors. But this is where the line has to be drawn between proprietary information and innovation on one side and safety on the other. 
eVTOLs aside, commercial aviation is and has always been a very competitive industry. There's been whole books about how Airbus and Boeing have been at each other's throat throughout the years, but there's always been one rule in the competitive jungle that all of them have been following. Airlines and aircraft manufacturers do not compete on safety. I cannot overstate how important this is. We often say that rules governing aviation safety have been written in blood, and that is sadly often true. The accidents and even the most minor incidents that we cover over on the Mentor Pilot channel are examined by investigators to see what needs to be changed or improved so that whatever problem or issue that caused the accident never has to be repeated. The rule of sharing safety-related information has been the backbone of aviation safety for many, many decades, back to almost the dawn of modern aviation. So let's take, for example, the accident of the, the Havilland Comet. The results of the thorough and extensive investigation following the comet crashes benefited not only the Havilland themselves, but the whole industry. It taught the industry many lessons about pressurization, metal fatigue, hydraulics, and much, much more. And prior to the comet, there just hadn't been enough reasons to study these areas. But after the comet crashes, it became painfully clear why that was so important. The studies that came out of this and their publication, along with the standards the industry set for future investigations, averted the losses of countless lives. But also, for the same reasons, the findings of these early crash investigations probably saved the Havilland's competitors quite some time and money. But that is a price that all companies in the industry, both airlines and manufacturers, accept because they know that this is not only about safety. This is also about how the traveling public perceives the safety of flying. The knowledge that manufacturers share information about safety builds confidence, which the whole industry ultimately depend on. And this is another aspect of safety culture. An aircraft manufacturer will never publicly question the safety of another manufacturer because implying that someone else is unsafe also implies that unsafe aircraft designs are acceptable or even exists. This is something that new eVTOL companies will need to be very careful about, as a recent article by Elon Head in the Air Current points out. Many eVTOL companies are relatively small startups with management that often lacks a direct aviation background. Of course, journalists will often ask them about how their designs compare to what their competitors are working on, and while boasting about your own design and the great work that your team is doing is normal and expected, boasting about your own safety record is a bit more delicate for this very reason. But not all eVTOL companies are small startups, and even some that are have very strong links with established manufacturers. Boeing, for example, has invested in an eVTOL company called Whisk, which has employed a lot of people with aviation experience. And Airbus has its own in-house eVTOL program that they call City Airbus NextGen. Embraer launched and then spun off its EVE Air Mobility program. So quite a few of these startups actually do have that type of background. It is worth mentioning here that there are established communication channels and processes for aircraft manufacturers to comment on what the other manufacturers are doing. Aviation authorities that are reviewing a new design will often ask for input from other parties, including competitors. In these events, a manufacturer will often bring up safety-related points and sometimes, since these are public discussions, you might hear a bit of criticism touching on safety matters. One recent example where we could see this happening involved the Airbus A321 XLR, which we did a video on recently, which you can check out up here. As we saw in that case, Airbus will need to redesign some parts of their aircraft because of its additional built-in fuel tank. Boeing commented on this, but it's worth noting here that a lot of media reports on the comment reworded them a bit too strongly, really, saying that Boeing raised safety concerns about the A321 XLR or that it brought up safety risks. What Boeing actually did was that it chose their words very carefully. Basically, their engineers wrote that the location of such an integral tank behind the landing gear presents the most extensive range of threats to be considered. And what ended up happening is that EASA, who is certifying the A21 XLR, agreed with Boeing and the others who raised these points. So EASA asked Airbus to modify its design slightly, enlarging and strengthening the fairing around the landing gear so that it would cover the new tank. 
This is how the industry works, to ensure everyone's safety. This is also why a manufacturer can react very strongly if someone openly questions the safety of their aircraft. We saw a really interesting example of that in the ongoing court fight between Qatar Airways and Airbus about the paint issue of the Airbus 350. I did a video about that last week, you can check it out up here, it's really fascinating. But the point I want to make with this video is to really highlight the importance of this safety culture that has existed for many, many decades within the aviation world. It is absolutely crucial that new joiners to the industry, in this case the EV tool companies, understands and shares this crucial information with their competitors, even if that means that they have to share some of their trade secrets. The absolute importance of continuing to build this industry as safe as possible and to increase the confidence of the traveling public cannot be overemphasized. And I really, really hope that these new joiners understand that. If you like this video and you want to support the work that me and my team does, then consider becoming part of my lovely Patreon crew. We have weekly hangouts where we can discuss anything aviation related or not, and I'd love to see you on one of those hangouts. Also, you can get yourself some merch. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.